Hello, and welcome to the first installment of the 2019 Expanding Research Partnerships web series. Today's webinar topic is Robotics and Workplace Safety and Health. My name is Peter Grandello, and it is my pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's webinar. This webinar will be conducted using Adobe Connect software. The software will be coming from your computer speakers. If you require technical assistance from Adobe Connect, please call 1-800-422-3623. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted in a few weeks at the website shown in the presentation. Closed captioning is available for this presentation and an unedited transcript will be available through email at dwilliams24 at cdc.gov. We would like to take we would like to provide some tips to optimize your Adobe Connect. The large main window in the upper left-hand corner of your monitor is the primary window for the presentation where you will be able to view presenter slides. In the upper right-hand corner of your screen, we provide additional notes for attendees, including information for technical support and a link for live closed captioning. Q&A window. For today's webinar, we will only take questions through the Q&A window. When asking a question, please provide the name of the presenter to whom the question is being asked. And please avoid the use of abbreviations or acronyms in your questions. Questions will be read in the order they are received by the moderator after all presentations have concluded. The file download windows provide participants an opportunity to download a PDF copy of today's presentation. The closed captioning viewer window will stream live captioning during this presentation just below the main window. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. Sarah Feltner, the Associate Director for Research Integration in the Office of Research Int Integration. Thank you, Peter. Um, this is Sarah Feltner, and it's a pleasure to be here today. And I want to welcome you all to the first installment of our 2019 Expanding Research Partnerships webinar series. The theme for this year's series is, is Emerging Issues, and we're excited to launch the webinar series with a discussion of robotics and workplace safety and health. We have a great panel of presenters today representing our intramural and extramural research communities, and I want to thank them very much for participating in today's discussion. I'd like to introduce our speakers and then go right into the webinar and also just make a note that we will take questions at the conclusion of all three presentations. Um, Dawn Castillo is our Director of, division, of the Division of Safety Research at NIOSH and also manager of the relatively new NIOSH Center for Ob Occupational Robotics Research. Fadi Fatala is a professor of biological and agricultural engineering and associate vice provost of global affairs at the University of California, Davis. And Andrew Merriweather is director of the ergonomics and safety program and associate professor of me mechanical engineering at the University of Utah. And as I mentioned, speakers will take questions at the conclusion of all three presentations. Please be sure to indicate who your question is for. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to invite our first speaker, Don Castillo, to the webinar. Don? Thank you, Sarah. And good afternoon or morning for those that are more westward. This is an outline for my presentation. I will be providing background on why NIOSH has established the Virtual Center for Occupational Robotics Research and an overview of the center. I will then discuss research needs that the center has identified and share information about several new pilots and research projects that will begin to address some of these research needs. First, some background. Robots are not new to workplaces. Robots have been used for decades to do work termed as the three Ds, dirty, dull, and dangerous, primarily in manufacturing settings. NIOSH was involved in research back in the 1980s and early 1990s that contributed to a strategy of keeping workers away from operating robots through the use of cages and robotic cells. This physical separation of robots and human workers has been quite effective, and traditional industrial robots have had a very good safety record. Existing occupational injury databases do not have codes to identify injuries associated with robots. 
However, using keywords, we estimated 61 robot-related deaths between 1992 and 2015 based on an analysis of the census of fatal occupational injury. This is less than 1% of the more than 190,000 workplace injury deaths during that time frame. Consequently, NIOSH has done little work associated with robots in the past couple of decades, focusing instead on research on more prominent causes of death, such as those associated with motor vehicles, falls, violence, and other types of machines. However, NIOSH has taken note of recent trends showing dramatic sales of robots and the emergence of new types of robots, including collaborative robots, that will not be confined to cages, but are being designed to work alongside and in collaboration with human workers. This is a picture of a collaborative robot in a laboratory setting. New types of worker protection strategies are being developed for these new types of robots, such as limiting the force of any impact between the human and the robot. Additionally, new types of robots are being introduced to businesses that have limited experience with robots, such as construction and warehouses. The picture on the left is of a robot being used to lay bricks in construction. The picture on the right is an Amazon fulfillment center in the United States, and the objects with the orange bases with blue shelves on top are mobile robots moving products within the warehouse. Drones and autonomous vehicles are also being created for specialized industrial applications, such as the use of drones for pesticide application and inspection of structures, use of autonomous vehicles in mining operations, and the piloting of driverless commercial trucks on U.S. roadways. Robotics technology is also being designed to be worn by workers to reduce the physical stress of demanding tasks and augment worker strength. These are termed exoskeletons and exosuits. It is also anticipated that artificial intelligence will be increasingly incorporated into robotics, fostering more decision-making and autonomy by robots. I would like to share with you an example of a worker death with a new robotics technology to illustrate how things can go wrong despite engineering controls. The death occurred in 2015 and was summarized by a program in Washington State which receives NIOSH funding support to investigate worker deaths to better understand contributing factors and identify prevention measures. This is a picture of a driverless forklift involved in this incident. The forklift was used to move pallets of water bottles and automatically navigated around the warehouse using a system of vehicle-mounted lasers and reflectors positioned throughout the warehouse. The forklift had safety sensors designed to detect objects or workers in the vehicle path. When a sensor detected an obstacle, the forklift would stop moving and an alarm would sound until a worker removed the obstacle. The manufacturer's manual requires a worker to initiate an emergency stop before removing an obstacle, and the forklift would then need to be re manually reset to start again. Shown on the right are strips of plastic wrap, often torn off of pallets during loading and unloading, that were known to stick to the fork and be seen as an obstacle by the forklift. Investigators believe that the worker attempted to remove a piece of plastic from under the elevated fork without first doing the emergency stop, and that he was likely bending or kneeling under the forks outside of the safety sensor field, and that when he removed the plastic, the forklift reset, bringing the elevated forks down, crushing him against the wheel cover of the vehicle. Emerging robotics technologies are quite remarkable and are part of what is being termed the fourth industrial revolution. There is the potential that they will improve worker safety by expanding the use of dangerous work done by robots rather than humans and by augmenting workers' abilities. However, there are also concerns that they will contribute to worker injury and illness. The new types of robots will require refined and new protection strategies. 
there are concerns that rapid advances in technology will outpace standard setting. Finally, increased use of robotics and concerns about job displacement may contribute to worker stress. Sorry about that. In response to the trends in robot sales and technology and wanting to proactively address implications for worker safety and health, NIOSH established the Center for Occupational Robotics Research in September of 2017. This is a virtual center that brings together NIOSH expertise from across NIOSH campuses and organizational units. The mission of the center is to provide scientific leadership to guide the development and use of occupational robots that enhance worker safety, health, and well-being. The center addresses traditional industrial robots as well as emerging robotics technologies, which include collaborative robots, mobile robots, powered exoskeletons in suits, remotely controlled and autonomous vehicles and drones, and increasingly automated robots utilizing advanced artificial intelligence. The center is actively building partnerships to help achieve our, object our objectives. Shown on this slide is a picture from the signing ceremony for our first official partnership. It is an OSHA-led alliance with Robotics Industry Association, which includes robot manufacturers and users, and is heavily involved in revising and developing standards. The Robotics Industries Association will be providing training to NIOSH and OSHA staff to help build our expertise, and we will jointly develop guidance materials for working safely with robots. This slide shows the various activities the center is engaged in. They range from monitoring trends and in injuries to developing guidance documents. They include evaluating robotics technologies as sources of and as interventions for workplace injuries and illnesses, and supporting the development and adoption of consensus standards. After a couple of final slides on the center, the rest of the presentation will focus on center work to identify research needs and conduct research. Shown on this slide are some recent scientific commentaries and associated blogs by NIOSH staff. They summarize market trends, the potential and concerns with evolving robotics technology generally, with exoskeletons, and with use of drones in construction. Links to these articles, blogs, and other products are available on the center website. The URL is on the slide and also the closing slide. When we established the center, one of the first things that we attended to was establishing research needs or gaps. The timing worked out well as NIOSH was in the process of updating its strategic plan for fiscal years 2019 to 23. The strategic plan is meant to guide both intramural and extramural research. The plan includes information on how NIOSH considered burden, need, and potential for impact when identifying priority research goals to include in the plan. Robotics-related research is included in strategic goals for traumatic injury prevention, musculoskeletal health, and healthy work design and well-being. Priority robotics-related research goals were identified for most industry sectors. The robotics research goals in the NIOSH strategic plan cover the four broad areas of research conducted by NIOSH including basic or etiologic research to identify injury risk factors and examine human-robot interactions, intervention research that includes evaluation of robots as interventions and prevention efforts to reduce robot-related injuries, translation research to identify effective strategies for ensuring that research and best practices are put into practice, and surveillance research to develop new methods, tools, and analytic techniques to identify robotics-related injuries. The robotics-related goals in the NIOSH strategic plan are fairly general. The center develops more detailed research needs that feed into and complement the goals in the strategic plan. We sought input from key federal partners and posted the detailed research needs for public comment. We received a couple of comments, then finalized these detailed research needs and posted them to the center website. 
I've provided an example of a detailed basic etiologic research need on the right. This is a specific research need that we identified from participation on the standards committees working to revise robot safety standards to ensure safety with new robots designed to work with and amongst human workers. The standards committees are currently using pain thresholds based on limited research done in Germany and have indicated a need for additional research in this area. The next set of slides provide information on the robotics-related goals in the NIOSH strategic plan. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but I want to give you a flavor for what's included. For any in the audience potentially interested in submitting grant applications to NIOSH, these slides will be useful in honing in on robotics-related research that NIOSH considers of high programmatic importance. The NIOSH strategic plan includes robotics-related research to address musculoskeletal health for five industry sectors, agriculture, construction, manufacturing, wholesale and retail trade, and healthcare and social assistance. These include basic etiologic research and intervention research. Robotics-related goals to prevent traumatic injury are on the next two slides. They include surveillance research in agriculture and construction, and basic etiologic and intervention research in agriculture, construction, and manufacturing. There are goals for preventing traumatic injuries in mining, services, and transportation, warehousing, and utilities. This includes research into drones as an intervention to prevent worker falls in the services sector, and automated vehicle technologies in the transportation sector. The final goal addresses the need to address the potential contribution of robot use to worker stress and fatigue, and it is specific to the transportation, warehousing, and utility sector. I will now share information about our current research portfolio. As I described earlier, based on the good safety record of traditional industrial robots, NIOSH has done limited work in robotics over the last couple of decades. We are beginning to build up our research portfolio with a proactive focus on emerging technologies. I will be describing pilot and nascent research with findings to come. For each research project, I've included email links to project officers. I would encourage you to follow up with project officers if you'd like to learn more about the research and explore the opportunity to collaborate with them. Our research portfolio includes fledgling efforts to identify the burden and characteristics of injuries associated with robots, three one-year pilots that have just been funded to provide seed money to help project officers develop quality research proposals, four full research projects that are in their second year of funding, and efforts being led by NIOSH's mining program in coordination with the Robotics Center to explore robotics technology solutions for that industry and to identify priority research for the future. With respect to surveillance, we are working on methods to better be able to identify and track injuries associated with these new technologies. This involves defining keyword searches and exploring the ability to identify cases in different databases. We have made a recommendation to the Bureau of Labor Statistics for potential changes to the coding system they and others use that would facilitate identification of cases. We are in the process of doing additional analyses of data from the Bureau of Labor Statistics Census of Fatal Occupational Injuries, and we'll be exploring the potential to analyze workers' compensation data. These efforts are being led by Larry Lane. The next few slides provide information on one-year pilot studies. The first is a project that will estimate pressure and force associated with two dynamic events, a human arm swinging into a robot and a human falling into a robot. Formative data from humans and robots, such as speed during collaborative tasks, will be collected independently, then used for simulations that estimate pressure and force. These estimated forces will be compared to those in the ISO technical specifications document for collaborative robots. This pilot project is being led by Brian Weimer and Hee Sun Choi and the National Institute for Standards and Technology as a partner. The next pilot project 
contact avoidance between human workers and collaborative robots, we'll investigate motion recognition of human workers, task planning strategies for a collaborative robot, and the effectiveness of a synthesized control strategy. This pilot study will use human subjects to identify contact-free zones in human and robot collaborative tasks and apply machine learning techniques for task planning in real time. This project is being led by Marvin Cheng and Hongwei Xiao and West Virginia University as a partner. The last pilot will explore the hypothesis that a drone operating in close proximity to a worker working at elevated heights, such as occurs in construction, may lead to worker instability, which could lead to a fall risk. This pilot will use human subjects and the NIOSH virtual reality cave to mimic work at heights and drones at different distances from the worker and measure the worker's sway, heart rate, and perceived distraction. This project is being led by Darlene Weaver and Jim Green, and partners include WVU Safety and Health Extension and a large construction company that uses drones in West Virginia. The next few slides describe research projects that each began about a year ago and are not scheduled to be completed until late 2021 or 2022. The first is a project that will evaluate grants from the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation to employers to purchase robotic equipment as a means of preventing worker injuries. This project will systematically review case study reports of such grants. An example of such a grant is depicted in the picture on the right. A grant was provided to an employer to purchase a robotic ribbon tie machine to reduce injuries associated with awkward postures and repetitive motion. The project will analyze workers' compensation experience of the cases before and after the grant and employer narrative reports that include information on risk abatement and employee acceptance and adoption. This project is led by Brian Lowe and he's partnering with the Ohio Bureau of Workers' Compensation. The next project, Prevention of Manual Materials Handling Injuries and Mining, is researching different injury prevention solutions, which includes determining the efficacy of exoskeletons. The project will analyze mining data to identify material handling tasks associated with shoulder overexertion injuries, determine physical requirements for those tasks, then assess the feasibility of exoskeletons to reduce these injuries. Janisha Pollard is the contact for this study. The next project, Improving Safety of Human-Robot Interaction, will examine human behavior while interacting with collaborative and mobile robots. The human behavior which will be studied includes the speed of the human's motion, comfort in distance to the robot, task performance, perceived safety, mental workload, and level of trust. The research will use the NIOSH Virtual Reality Laboratory to examine human behavior in response to different sizes, speeds, and trajectories of robots. The project will also look at the effect of different robot-to-human communication designs, such as visual or auditory interface modalities and message types on communication effectiveness and trust. This project is led by Heeson Choi and Hung Wei Xiao, and partners are North Carolina State University and the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute. The last project is evaluating the effects of large truck automation on driver and road safety. The project's specific aims are to determine the minimum time for a driver to regain situational awareness and effectively take back control of the automated vehicle with and without distractions and under different levels of automation and requirements for driver engagement and active monitoring of the environment. This project will use NASH's virtual driving simulator and human subjects. The project is being led by Mahmoud Rahman and Hung Wei Xiao, and partners are AAA Foundation, Crash Safety Solutions, and Mississippi State University. The final component of NASH's research portfolio is work on robotics technologies and automation conducted by the mining program. The mining program has been engaged for several years in supporting the development of technologies to improve mine worker safety and health. This includes a prototype snake robot shown on this slide, which can go into a mine site following a disaster 
and provide data on atmospheric conditions and two-way communication. Recently, the mining program has begun a process to prioritize research to address the health and safety implications of trends towards increased automation and digitized mines, such as shown in the bottom picture. Jeff Welsh and Todd Ruff are the contacts for this effort. I'd like to wrap up with takeaways from my presentation. Robotics technology is an important and emerging area for occupational safety and health research. These technologies hold considerable promise for improving worker safety by doing dirty, dull, and dangerous work rather than humans. But there is also the potential for negative harms to humans that the occupational safety and health research community should attend to. These include unintended and harmful contact between humans and robots and stress to human workers associated with this new technology and the potential for their jobs to disappear. The new NIOSH Center aims to provide scientific leadership to conduct research that helps ensure the use of robotics to enhance worker safety and well-being. Among our initial activities were to develop research goals that can guide NIOSH intramural and extramural robotics research. The NIOSH intramural and extramural program, which you'll learn a little bit more about in the next couple of presentations, is small, but it is growing. I hope that this presentation might spark your interest in this issue and area of research. Thank you very much for your attention. My contact information is on the slide if you'd like to follow up after the presentation. Don, thank you very much. Um, and we're going to just go right into the next uh, presentation by Fadi Fatala from uh, the University of California, Davis. Fadi? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Um, hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Um, I would like first to acknowledge uh, my colleague, uh, Professor Stavros Bajikas, uh, who is the robotic expert on, on our team. Um, so today what I would like to do is, is kind of give you first an introduction about the industry and the strawberry industry and then go, go into um, the, some of the examples of the robotic work that we've been doing in that, in that area. Um, so the, as a background, the strawberry industry in California actually is, is the nation's leading uh, producer. So the, the state of California is, is the largest uh, by far. And we have about uh, 37,000 acres and about $2.5 billion in production value. So it is a sizable, one of the, the, the high uh, cash crop in, in the state. Um, as a, from a labor standpoint, uh, strawberry harvesting is actually a very intensive task and, and expected by, uh, we expect that many workers, and we, we know that many workers suffer from musculoskeletal disorders, especially of the lower back and to a certain extent the upper extremities. Um, and the industry is trying to find good means to control the low back disorders, of course, and, and, and the musculoskeletal disorders while maintaining acceptable or, in, or even increased productivity uh, levels. So. To that extent, so if you look at the traditional strawberry harvest, uh, essentially all people, what, what the workers would do, um, they select the strawberry, and, and they, they have they have to kind of decide whether whether it's a good good uh, uh, fruit or not, and they pick it, and then load it into either a plastic clamshell, the one you see at uh, Safeway and Kroger, um, or or the plastic crates, um, the, the smaller ones, um, and they vary between one pound and, and four pounds. And they, they load those cl either clamshells or trays or into a tray. Uh, it's a sheet of that takes uh, between four and, and six uh, uh, boxes. And they, they basically uh, have to transport it, have to walk to the end of the furrow to kind of uh, really uh, deposit it into, into um, uh, a place where, where, where it could be taken to, to a processing or, or a, a delivery. So this is this is the the idea is the the walking is about 300 I mean the furrow itself is 300 uh, feet uh, yards long so the workers could potentially walk about 150 yards if they're in the middle of the furrow uh, so you can see that the walking is actually is about 30 to 40 percent um, of of the total time of the workers spent in the field so, so for that reason you know. Uh, the industry has been exploring ideas that to kind of increase productivity to reduce the the um, 
the walking the walking time. Um, so the, the the idea of harvest aid have been have been out for a, for a while, but now the industry is trying to really kind of uh, to to deploy them in, into the field and see see what what happens as far as the the productivity. But little has been done actually about the musculoskeletal. So what what are the health effects on the workers, especially from a musculoskeletal standpoint? Um, so in those terms, so if you see the pictures in there, they're essentially the platforms that that actually are close to the workers, and as they as they're uh, picking and filling the trays, they just walk a few yards instead of walking all the way down to the end of the furrow. And the system is actually motorized, so it just as as you're moving, your uh, the, the the platform will move move away from you in a way to kind of give you space, and then and then you can deposit the the uh, tray on on those platforms. Um, so that's uh, so that potential saving is fairly fairly substantial from from the industry standpoint, and and they estimate about between 30 to 50 percent have been reported with these aids. And again, uh, but however, on the other side, you you're almost continuously working. So I'll I'll compare the two in a way right now. So if you look at the traditional um, harvesting. From a from a standpoint of, of labor, it's fairly low cost because you're you're basically uh, using only only uh, labor costs and there's no major capital investment into into an equipment. Uh, so they, that's why uh, you know still a lot of lot of uh, operations they rely on labor. Unfortunately, uh, California and other states they're having a huge labor shortage. So this is where the industry now they're really um, looking into alternatives. Um, the the uh, on the other side again, like I said earlier, the walking is is hopefully will give you a break, and then especially a, a low back relief. On the other side, the low productivity is is an issue for especially for the industry. Um, so the harvest aids, and if you summarize, the pros of it is the you increase productivity, and but in the, by reducing the the transport time. The cons, of course, the uh, high capital investment. So those machines, uh, they can cost up to hundred thousand dollars for their large, large one. The ones take up to fifteen to twenty workers. Uh, there are a few of those, but not, not as many. But now the 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 smaller ones are are about between five and nine workers. They range between twenty thousand and forty thousand. Um, and then the problem with with the system is uh, it's it's a slow moving system that when it reaches the end of the furrow. It takes it quite a bit of time to actually rotate the, the system to kind of come back to the to the un, unpicked furrows. So uh, they estimate about 15 minutes almost to kind of really get get the system back into the the un, unpicked uh, area. Uh, so that's that's an area that of concern for the for the, both the workers and and the the industry, uh, the producers. And the, the other side that I mentioned, the, the problem is the workers are pretty much continuously stooping, right? So they, they are, they're almost continuously picking, they walk a little bit, and then they, they just literally keep, keep picking. Um, so that's, that's a, again, like a, a, as I mentioned, is a concern for, from our perspective and, and the industry too. Um, so, for, as, so this is where we were thinking, of, you know, my, my colleague, Professor Vajukas, has, has been working on this issue for a while. Can we really develop uh, an alternative harvesting system that, that involves a collaborative ro robot that helps you with the, with the, uh, uh, the picking, the, the, the walking issue that we talked about? So instead of having the worker walk, can we have a robot that actually communicates with the, with the worker and then what they're doing? And then this side wanted to deploy and then pick up the tray uh, and, and deliver it to the end of the federal. That's kind of the general concept behind it. Um, so, so the idea is to optimize basically the, the worker's productivity with, without compromising the health effect of especially musculoskeletal disorder. Is there, a, is there an optimal point where we're keeping a acceptable productivity levels while we're, we're actually having the workers in, in uh, not exposing them to extreme uh, stooping, stooping uh, uh, situations. So, th th as a system, so they, there are two main components to it. One, one of them is the an instrumented cost. So these are the 
um, what's called a carito. So th this is a cart, basically, that, that most uh, workers use. There are various versions of it, but this is one that one, uh, Professor Regula's team has been looking at. Essentially, it's an instrumented, instrumented cart. So it's a, we took the regular cart and then instrumented to allow, allow the, um, so it has load cells to allow it to measure continuously the weight of the, of the, uh, of the tray. So we know that they, what the weight is uh, when it's full. So we know that the, the work is, is done pretty much. So this is where you can dispatch, dispatch the information back to the robot, and the robot will come to pick, pick up that tray. Um, so, so this is a, there's a GPS module on it uh, for to give you location data, uh, and then it has a long range uh, wireless system to transmit that data again, like I said, to the robot. And and that data is used actually for predictive scheduling for the robot's operation. So there's an optimization uh, system that Dr. Vujicos is working on to to really say when is the best time to kind of come in and pick it based on the information from the worker. Uh, through the instrumented instrumented uh, 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 cut, yeah. so that's that's kind of the, the first component, and then and then from there is the, the this information is relayed. Sorry about that. Yeah, I, I was looking at the wrong slide. So this is this is the one that uh, the instrumented, and then the robot on the other side, and so that's the the uh, the, uh, the, uh, the Instrumented cart. So this is this is the the uh, classic uh, again cart that we used in in the, in the harvesting. We instrumented it to kind of measure measure the um, how much weight the the cart is taking. Again, so the idea is this will transmit to the to the uh, collaborative robot. So this is the collaborative robot that that have been kind of historically developed. The first one is on the left is a small, they're all small footprint, uh, but uh, 12 inch, 12 inch wide. They fit within the furrow that most furrows will, will fit those robots. Um, and then the earlier version is a low cost. It was a, essentially a student project um, that, that didn't have any GPS um, and just, just to literally transport uh, the, the trays from, from the furrow to the end of the furrow from the worker. And then, and then the the other the other version of it is in the middle. Is essentially we added we added the, a GPS system again to communicate with the instrumented car, and and really know exactly when when the um, the location of the person and the cart and and when when the uh, trays are full. So so again the the robot will go and, and pick up those trays. Uh, and then the the uh, the latest version, uh, or actually one before, is actually a low, uh, again a low-cost one. But they we added uh, an active balance control system to allow to maneuver b better in the in the furrow. So it's, it's trying to improve the stability um, of of the system. So there's still still prob problem actually having having those type of uh, robots. Uh, they have uh, uh, adequate for the large-scale operations, and in, in, so we still need to work on those on those issues. Um, so this is where we're actually developing uh, another system right now, where actually it crosses two furrows, so it's a it, it sort of straddle over over the field, and then it, it it goes. This this will provide more stability for the uh, for, for the system, so it can it can transverse across across the furrow, two furrows, and then across the field. Um, we are we are working right now on on that on that version, and hopefully that that will provide more uh, field field uh, ready system. But the concept still holds. So, uh, as far as the, the specific research project, at least from the human side of things, so essentially trying to investigate combined effects of operating. Uh, speed and time breaks for uh, multi-person uh, harvest aid, the one I, I mentioned earlier, and the collaborative ro robots based on what is the optimal combination of productivity and, and the biomechanical and musculoskeletal response from a fatigue standpoint and, and, and uh, uh, survey, symptom surveys from the, from the workers. 
So for the harvest aid, we're actually uh, we're completing and building a harvest aid system to kind of simulate various combinations of of the uh, scenarios that would be would be faced in in situations uh, uh, that operations that use har these harvest aids. So we're gonna we're surveying various various kind of configurations. We try to simulate those to kind of say which ones are are you know can place more. Uh, uh, more musculoskeletal, so the risk on, on, on the workers, um, and then try to find out find out the optimal. Again, uh, can we deploy rest breaks to to, to those workers that, that will will maintain a good uh, musculoskeletal health while maintaining good productivity? Um, so we can simulate various speeds and and, and various field configurations in these. Uh, so the the optimal idea is to to develop optimal speed for these for these to deploy in the in the field, and and hopefully uh, again will result that one will result in in a in a good uh, situation as far as musculoskeletal health. As far as the collaborative robot robots and where we are right now, we're, we're completing the productive scheduling dispatching algorithm. So this is this is where Again, when when do you actually get the robot uh, to go and pick up those trays is, is is a crucial thing, and and um, and we can actually give breaks to to force breaks to the to the workers by by actually not coming right, so they can be they can be withdrawn a little bit to kind of force the workers uh, to kind of take breaks. So this is the where we're working on what is optimal scheduling. Uh, Professor Vajuk has actually figured a way. You can do 100% continuous picking with these systems if you want. So there's there's an algorithm that allows you to do that, but that's not the. Uh, this is even worse than than the harvest aid in a way because the workers will be continuously working. So the, we're trying to find the, again the optimal uh, uh, approach where where it's actually a combination of breaks plus plus picking. Uh, again, the robots will receive data from the worker about time spent in stool posture. So, so we can have it both ways, I mean, two ways. Either we can put a, a sensor on on the worker we know, uh, when we know how much posture they, they're, they're doing, so we know the exactly the percent, percent of time they're in stool posture. Or even we can rely on the, on the instrumented cart because we know the weight. As the weight is increasing, that means they're picking. So, so both, both data will, will be useful for that. Um, and the robot is again dispatched to implement optimal rest speed. It's, we're hoping that's that's the the uh, optimal uh, kind of combination, like I said earlier. And and then another another area of, of interest is is actually the robot could actually deliver deliver water to the workers. So from a heat stress standpoint, this could be an, an another intervention instead of making the workers walk all the way down for where the water coolers are. Um, so it is, it is a, a good. Um, it, you can just you can deploy other other interventions uh, to the workers. Uh, so that's kind of the the hope for the for those systems. And then from from a biomechanical standpoint, from a musculoskeletal standpoint, we're we're now piloting the the uh, um, kind of biomechanical response of the workers. Uh, the we're going to capture musculoskeletal uh, uh, response through electromyography, EMG, and then the postural or kinematic data. We have uh, initial measurement units. Uh, we have full body, and then we have portable ones. So we're going to instrument the, the workers to get actually detailed detailed information about about their uh, kinematics and, 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 and motion and postures. And this way, we can have objective measures of of what are the implications of, of these, uh, the robots and the harvest aids when we deploy them in various uh, algorithms and various uh, various uh, combinations. So that's that's where we are right now. When we're piloting the musculoskeletal survey, uh, the symptom surveys and the fatigue uh, symptoms, uh, fatigue uh, surveys too, to kind of really have, have it uh, fitting the situation that, that it is uh, faced in strawberry. So just to kind of wrap up uh, in there, so we, we know the harvest aid, uh, you know, it, they are they are actually on the rise right now in, in in at least in California for sure, and but however, unfortunately, they could be detrimental to the workers' health uh, due to the current almost near continuous picking uh, practice. Uh, 
so the deployment speed and optimal rest breaks are again uh, we're, we're trying to figure out what is the optimal way to deploy these um, and then the, the robots the low cost robots may provide an alternative harvesting approach because we can really look at the at the time spent in the in in during harvesting and we can actually uh, figure out the optimal deployment uh, scheme so uh, so, and again, the productivity data from the other one will be helpful. Uh, okay, so that's uh, that's what I have uh, so far, and, and then um, I'd like to acknowledge our, our team. So we have students involved in, in, in uh, researchers and development engineers, and then, of course, the research support from NIOSH and USDA uh, NIFA. So, and then we'll hold on on the, thank you uh, for, for listening, and we'll hold on on the questions to the end. Fadi, thank you very much. Um, and now I'm um, pleased to introduce our last speaker for today's webinar, Andrew Merriweather from uh, the University of Utah. So Andrew, we'd invite you to pull up your slides. And we'll take questions um, at the conclusion of Andrew's presentation. Well, thank you, Dr. Feltner. And I also want to thank NIOSH for hosting this webinar series. And for those participating today, good morning or afternoon. Um, we've already heard some pretty exciting new ideas and opportunities to advance worker safety and health through uh, human-robot interactions or collaborations. So my talk today really represents work being done to improve ergonomics during this interaction and is being completed jointly by students in my lab, the, the Ergonomics and Safety Lab, but also the Robotics Center at the University of Utah and my colleague, Tucker Hermans, from the Utah Learning Lab for Manipulation Autonomy. So as a trained injury biomechanist and a mechanical engineer, I've kind of taken the approach of using my understanding of injury causation and biomechanics and system design to develop optimal interactions between human users and their environment. So the definition of ergonomics that from the International Ergonomics Association on this slide really focuses on that fact of humans interacting with other elements of a system to optimize the well-being and overall system performance. So as we've seen industry change, and Don mentioned this a little bit, we've kind of entered into this realm of cyber physical systems or Industry 4.0. And these changes, including artificial intelligence, and machines making decisions present great opportunities and challenge, specifically for human workers. The goal of human-robot interaction, or HRI, is to further improve system performance while recognizing, of course, that humans and robot workers working in synergy can achieve more than they can otherwise achieve independently. Now, we've heard fears of robots taking over you know, human jobs, but we also see some benefits of improving uh, HRI using robotics to reduce work-related injuries, especially if we implement that coordination or collaboration properly. So I, how is this possible? As a good as good as robotics have become and as quickly as technology is evolving, humans are still a lot better at many things than robots. And I think that's probably going to be the case for uh, a foreseeable future. But robots have their strengths as well and do some things better than human workers can. So the challenge, or yet the better question might be, how do we optimize this relationship to take advantage of human strengths and robot strengths to have truly synergistic collaboration. For example, if we try to minimize the mismatch between a human's capabilities and re task requirements using a robot, we can take this example of a welding task. Depending on the complexity of the parts in the assembly or what's required to manipulate and fixture the parts, we could envision a collaborative environment where a robot could provide assistance and engage the worker to create a more efficient task without necessarily needing to invest in a fully automated process where everything's roboticized. And this goal ultimately improves human performance, improves 
to improve the safety and productivity and efficiency and possibly even reduces the need for some forms of training. So the real question is not whether this can be done successfully. A better question is how do we optimally balance the human and robot capabilities with, with these task requirements. And that's how we take the most advantage of this human-robot interaction. Moving towards a shared workspace, we've seen you know, historically robots and, and humans have been isolated from one, one another because of safety reasons. But as we move towards shared workspaces and collaborative or cooperative robots, how humans interact safely is a key to achieving the optimal balance that will result in a higher productivity and speed um, and reduce injuries. So we see this uh, idea of an optimally shared workspace between robots and humans. And a lot of what was presented previously during this webinar has kind of illustrated some of those needs that we have and the lack of information to safely accommodate this shared workspace. So how do we improve the ergonomics and prevent musculoskeletal disorders if we do have humans and robots sharing the same workspace? And that's kind of the uh, purpose of my talk today. So we see examples of HRI, and they've existed for a while, especially in healthcare and manufacturing, uh, such as during robot or robotic or teleoperated surgeries or robot-assisted manufacturing, as shown in these pictures. Uh, most people are familiar with the intuitive surgical da Vinci robot that's illustrated there on the left. One challenge with these human-robot interactions is being able to quantify the physical burden of the task on the human worker using traditional uh, ergonomic analysis methods. So today I want to talk about how we can perform posture assessment during this type of HRI, and specifically how we can use the robot to perform the ergonomic assessment and modify the interaction to improve the safety and comfort of the operator without sacrificing task performance. Most of these interactions that are close, uh, kind of intimate interactions with the robots make it challenging to observe because of the shared workspace and occlusions, whether it's from the robot itself or machinery or other fixtures that may be in the surrounding area of the workspace. Teleoperation is one area where humans are in direct contact, contact with a haptic device or a robot um, where another robot performs a task based on the inputs and actions of the human operator. Taking uh, this example here, we have a surgeon at an operative console, and we have other medical professionals and assistants that are working at the operating table with the robot that's performing the actual surgery on the patient. A skilled surgeon operates the haptic device, um, and additionally, these other professionals may interact with the robotic arms that are working on the patient. So the question is, how do we optimize the system to not only manage risk for the patient, but also manage the risk of the healthcare workers who are interacting with the robotic devices without affecting their performance? We can do this by optimizing the HRI uh, following a couple of steps. And to do this in the context of ergonomics, we want to understand and determine the human operator posture and account for the risk factors that are um, often associated with ergonomics, force, posture, frequency, duration, those types of things. And that's our real-time ergonomics monitoring. And then once we have that model and understanding, we can provide feedback through the robot interaction that then optimizes and improves the comfort and even potentially increases the performance or enhances the capability of the folks who are working with the robot. Some of the research that's been published, uh, most of it includes um, ergonomic analysis using a method known as the Rapid Upper Limb Assessment, or RULA, and using the posture categories for specific joints. A composite risk score is obtained, and then a robot is manipulated to try and keep the worker in a better posture. 
One of the challenges using a method such as RULA, however, to guide a robot interacting with a human is really the lack of many other factors associated with the risk that's arising from the dynamic nature of the movement of the task. And also the very coarse posture categories and simplifications in RULA to define risk are difficult to interpolate for smooth robot control. So one of the methods that my group's using currently is augmenting some of the value that RULA provides with more uh, comprehensive musculoskeletal models such as what I've shown here from an, up, from an upper extremity model in the software OpenSim. So now we can use the information such as uh, posture, muscle properties, joint loading, the frequency, duration, and even embed psychosocial factors into these models to have a more comprehensive understanding of how to make decisions and improve the resolution and freedom to adjust the interaction to better manage the risk of the user. We call this real-time ergonomics monitoring. As I mentioned, it's not necessarily a, a new concept. Um, many folks have done this using visual message methods or IMUs, wearable sensors. But most of these suffer from problems with either uh, sensor integrity, lack of visibility, or other uh, problems that occlude the position of the worker uh, from the robot or from the vision system. So these limitations have inspired the work that I'm presenting now, which is how do we use the robot as the sensor to predict the posture of the human operator? So our method uses the robot as the only sensor to estimate posture, which doesn't need any other sensors or vision systems. And we think this work can be extended not only from our teleoperations, but also to wearable exoskeletons that learn optimal postures over time and improve task efficiency and user performance. And this is kind of the workflow of the experiment that we've designed where a person is interacting with a haptic device to perform a few functions. So I want to walk through uh, what that experiment looks like. We used a uh, Quanzer HD squared high definition haptic input device, and we measured the posture doing four relatively simple tasks as illustrated here with A, B, C, and D. We also tracked the user's posture with traditional um, laboratory marker-based methods and also a a connect markerless um, system. So to begin with, we needed a model. We created a 10 degree of freedom model of the upper body, as shown here, and we use a partially observable dynamic system to solve for the most probable human posture given the location of the robot input device. Because as we know, to control a robot, that robot's uh, position in space is known very precisely. So if we know the robot's position and know a human uh, interacting with that robot, or in this case grasping that robot end effector, can we use that to predict what the uh, optimal posture is for the human? Another key feature of the approach that we use is the ability to determine posture with minimal information about the user. So for example, in this graph that's shown on the slide, we compared the difference between taking full measurements of all the body segments versus using a population percentile to estimate segment lengths based on height, and then only using a population percentile measurement to estimate the entire model. Uh, as we expected, the, the more precise our measurements, the better our model, but ultimately, the difference was so small, it didn't warrant a strong need for precise anthropometric measurements of each user, and our model was still robust. The next step, because this is called a partially observable dynamic system, we have a precise location of the robot end effector. That's what's observable. But what's not observable in this case is the actual human posture that's represented there uh, on the slide by the vector Q. So if we think about this in terms of a human arm, each of the angles that define our posture are an anatomical angle, as, like I've shown here. And we can represent the entire posture by using that vector Q. 
So now we need to introduce some uncertainty into our prediction because there are many possible posture combinations that may result in any given hand position. So given this information about segment relationships and biomechanics and, uh, that are included in our model, we use a Bayes network to estimate the most probable posture given the observed position of the robot, Z. And we do this using a particle filtering approach where we model the uncertainty as a Gaussian distribution. So I want to walk through, since this may be new to many of you, um, a simple particle filter approach and how it works. So on this picture, we've presented three particles, X, 1, 2, and 3. In the research that we've done, we typically use about 1,000 particles. So these particles represent a possible posture to achieve a position. And then we generate these particles and we run an optimization. So after those particles are initiated, we perform a process update. So on a previous slide, those, that process update is defined by the kinematics or equations of motion. And from that, we can determine the possible locations of a hand given uh, the information we have of that moving object. Once we do this, we compare that, uh, those particles to the observation of the robot Z, which represents the robot end effect or position. We then look at the difference between our particles and the location of each of those. And using the weighted particle, we find the most probable one. And from that, we repeat the process. We perform resampling from the weighted particle we conduct another process update based on the kinematics of the model and the equations of motion. Then we compare those again to the actual value of the position of the robot. And finally, we resample and we do this iteratively until we obtain convergence on the most probable posture. So I want to talk about some experimental results. In our study, we performed these four tasks I mentioned before with 10 subjects that completed them in a random order with multiple repetitions. Uh, and so this is a picture of one of our subjects interacting with the Quanzer HD squared, performing the pick and place task with the Legos. And on the right, you can see the model from the motion capture in the middle, and then the simplified dynamic model, the partially observable system on the right. So this is a busy slide with lots of information, so uh, hopefully if you've downloaded the slides, you can digest this uh, more after, after the presentation. You can see here the root mean square error for each of the 10 degrees of freedom in the model. One clear problem we had tracking motion with a, a Connect 2 was occlusion, where because of the, the Quanzer robot and also the, the workstation, the table that was set up, the Connect sensor no matter how hard we tried, was unable to uh, track the posture reliably and consistently. The results from our model, shown in blue, compared very well with the motion capture that's shown in red. Um, this represents a root mean square error of just under about 10 degrees, so there's still room for improvement, and further uh, refinements to our algorithm are being made with better biomechanical constraints to improve our predictions. This is a, a summary of the results by task, where you see about that 10 to 15 degree uh, RMS deviation from the actual postures that were measured. So ultimately, using this approach, the, goal, the robot can generate a plan that ergonomically optimizes posture without compromising performance to still complete the task. And it does this by replanning by moving with the human, and by learning the effects of fatigue and performance to implement control. So um, this is done using another algorithm for optimization, creating a continuous exposure model where costs are associated with changing postural states, as illustrated in this figure. So in summary, po probabilistic posture modeling using the robot as our only sensor seems to have the potential to fit different users without specific measurements and without any additional sensors to optimize the ergonomic risk during HRI. And we plan to 
expand these experiments to other more complex interactions and tasks, but we'll likely end up using a hybrid strategy that leverages the advantages of vision-based posture analysis methods with our partially observable probabilistic method that I presented here. So uh, thank you very much. Andrew, thank you very much. And I want to thank all of our speakers for um, their excellent presentations and also um, being so mindful of, of their time, which leaves us plenty of time for questions. Um, we invite you to write your questions in the Q&A box that you'll see on your monitor. And um, we'll actually read these questions as they come in. If you would, please identify the uh, speaker you'd like to address your questions or comments to. And um, Peter Grandello is going to read these for us. So Pete, I believe we have a, a comment for Andrew. Uh, yes, we do. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, this is a comment for Andrew, and I'll be re reading it verbatim. This comment is regarding the autonomous vehicles, forklift fatality example. If I understand correctly, the manufacturer of the autonomous vehicle forklift indicated if a sensor is triggered resulting in the vehicle stopping, the operator must use the emergency stop to safely remove the object and not rely on the interlock to prevent vehicle motion. Take this example and apply it to autonomous vehicles being tested on public roads. It would not be feasible for an autonomous sensor once triggered to be reset in a similar fashion. From a design standpoint, I believe an interlock should never be capable of initiating machine motion. If the sensors act as an interlock, then they should not initiate machine motion, if I remember correctly. OK, so hopefully this question was intended for me, because I think this came from Don's talk. Um, from a safety point of view, having this interlock being removable, if you compare it to something that may be more familiar with uh, like a lockout tagout procedure to lock out any uh, unintended release of energy uh, during a procedure, I think we can probably adopt some of the same strategies used for lockout tagout to robotics where we don't rely specifically on a sensor to make the decision, but it requires some conscious effort and interaction um, from the user. I'm not sure if that answered the question well, but that's my best uh, shot. So this is Don, and I'll just note that the issue of, of the driverless vehicles and how to deal with a, a myriad of potential um, issues that the, the vehicle would need to address is really controversial and it's um, complicated. And so it, and it's not my understanding, which, and I'm not an engineer, I'm an epidemiologist, but my understanding is that they're looking at programming, you know, given feedback in a variety of situations, um, you know, what would the, the vehicle do? And, and that's um, complicated. There, there are examples of, you know, if you're, if there's a, a baby carriage in front of the car, and there's 10 people off to the side, you have the vehicle go towards the, the baby carriage or off to the side. So um, again, it's complicated, lots of things to work through, lots of concerns about it. It's algorithm-based. Um, and it's, I don't think that they're looking at um, issues of the interlocks, which is what was with the forklift. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you very much there, Don Castilla. We do have another question that came in, and this question is also for Don. Could you describe more about the funding model of the center? The projects are led by the contacts with partners from academia and industry. So the, currently, the, the center has some intramural funding to get it off of the ground. And we're using that, that funding for um, things like building up laboratory capacity. Intramurally, the, the staff that are interested in doing re research in robotics, they um, participate in a competition that, um, that happens across the institute across a variety of topics. The partnerships um, are ones where we've identified mutual interests, and so we are, um, you know, there's in-kind services that are provided um, to, to supplement the intramural funding. We are hoping, um, one of the things I had noted is that the NIR strategic plan was meant to guide research intramurally and extramurally. 
Um, we are hoping that the extramural community will look at those research goals and consider submitting um, proposals, for example, into the R01 or the R03 that would satisfy it. Thank you very much, Don. Uh, at this moment, uh, I see that there's some editing for a few more questions. We will see if they actually come through. Uh, is there any general comments or thoughts that any of the presenters would like to add on any of the other questions? Okay, great. If we could just have a few more moments. I see Don Jania is working in the background to add a few more questions. Thank you, Don. And uh, still a few more, like I said, another question is coming through. Uh, apologize for the delay here. Okay, this next question is for any one of the three presenters. Regarding workers' compensation studies for robotic intervention, have you partnered with any private insurers or just the workers' comp carriers? So this is Don, and I'll note that we've got one project that's currently looking at it, and it is partnering with a um, state workers' comp carrier. We um, also, the Robotic Center has closed discussions with our Center for Workers' Compensation Studies, so I do think that there's a potential in the future, um, and we would love to entertain discussions with the private insurers. The, the workers' comp, I think, has potential both for, um, you know, what this question is about, where you're using the data to analyze whether or not um, you know, robotic interventions has made an impact on, um, on worker safety and health. But another potential avenue for the use of the workers' comp study is to help us understand what the burden is of the injuries and illnesses, especially as the emerging technologies are introduced into the workplace. So we see great potential with workers' comp. We're looking forward to having additional partnerships beyond the, the single project that we have. Thank you very much, Don. Fatty or Andrew, would you like to address this question as well? Hi, this is Andrew. Yeah, this is. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. So here in Utah, we have a, a close working relationship with the Workers Comp Fund of Utah, and one of the things that we're looking at as this technology is emerging is also tracking very carefully and closely the um, injury claims that come because of human, you know, robot interactions with these collaborative robots. Um, but beyond that, there's no additional work that we're doing yet. We don't quite understand what the problems will be and how to address them. Yeah, this is Fadi. Uh, uh, in California, actually, we, we have a really good uh, relationship with the largest insurers in, in the state. Um, in, I think in the past we've, we've worked with them on specific projects and you know, related to various crops, and, but we haven't done done a close relationship about the robotics issue. But that that will be actually it is open for for potential uh, ideas, and, and especially especially as far as uh, look at, looking uh, prospectively on on the effect of of these uh, when you deploy these, then we get some data. Uh, uh, injury, injury, and incidents with data on, on, on their deployment. I mean, that'll be that'll be something that we would be interested in, and would be, would be most likely reaching out to, to those insurers. Thank you very much. And as a reminder, uh, if people would like to ask a question, they can do it in the question or the Q&A window in the middle right-hand side of the screen. You can just type the question in. As mentioned earlier, please address to whom the question is being asked, and please avoid uh, acronyms and abbreviations. Uh, we do have a follow-up question for Don. Um, this is also related as a continuation question from the Compensation Studies and Workers' Comp. Specifically, it reads, um, so there is collaboration with the NIOSH Workers' Comp Department? So um, I'll just do a little bit of background. So one of the ways that NIOSH organizes its effort is it establishes these, these centers. And so the, the centers are um, 
what they do is they bring together expertise across the institute. Um, they have small bits of funding. In addition to the, the Center for Occupational Robotics Research, another center is our Center for Compensation Studies. We um, are, I'm in court in, um, in continual communication with the head of the Center for Workers' Comp Studies. So we, we coordinate, and I would consider the, the one project that I described where we're looking at the, um, the safety grants in the Ohio Workers' Bureau Comp, I would consider that a collaboration between the two centers. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, bear with me. Uh, there are a few more questions, I believe, uh, that are coming through. Uh, does any one of the uh, presenters like to address potentially Ohio State's compensation uh, workers' comp system? Okay. And I'm going down to another one. Sorry, we have a little bit of a technical difficulty in the background. Okay, uh, this question is also for Dawn. And it says, are you interested in partnering with large retailers for research and guidance on autonomous robots? So we are absolutely interested in building partnerships with um, employers that are using robotics technology, which would include large retailers. Where um, you know many of these technologies are just emerging, the, the the companies that are using them are gaining experience, and we see it as a perfect time to come together and bring you know NIOSH's expertise, either intramurally or extramurally, to bear on looking at doing evaluations and and risk assessments about the robotics technology. So um, yes, we would be interested. We don't currently have any um, any existing partnerships with large retailers. We do have, um, I, I noted that we're in the, the business right now of building up partnerships. One of our recent ones that we're very excited about is we've recently joined the Advanced Robotics for Manufacturing Institute. They have about 170 members across government robot manufacturers, users of robots, and that's one avenue for, um, for us to, to make those connections. Okay, thank you very much. I ha also have a general question for the three presenters, and it read, what additional insight might you offer about drone research? What additional impacts on worker safety have been observed? So I hate to monopolize. I'll go ahead and, and give my perspective, and, um, and maybe Andrew and, and Fadi will have additional ones. Um, there's a, a very nice um, article that was on one of the, our slides that I had done that looked at um, drones in construction. And just with all of the emerging technologies that we've talked about, they, they hold great potential for increasing worker safety um, by being able to perform tasks um, that would remove, you know, if the drone is doing an inspection at a height, um, then you don't have to have the worker at the height. Um, however, there's, there's always the flip side as well, is that as we come into an environment where we've got, um, you know, work environments can be pretty complicated. You've got multiple workers doing multiple tasks. You've got different equipment. And then when you introduce drones that are at, um, you know, working within the air within a work environment, we do have to be concerned about what the impacts might be on a worker. We have the one pilot study looking at, well, might it affect um, balance of a worker? There's also um, you know, concerns about what if there's a failure of the drone and it somehow goes off path and or falls and, and lands on a worker. I will note that um, there is the FAA right now has um, a request for a proposed rulemaking that would um, expand the use of drones working over people and at night. And um, that's something that I, you know, that has implications for worker safety and health. And I hope that anyone who has um, expertise or experience in working in environments with workers will comment. This is Andrew. So I'll, I'll weigh in. This is not my area of research, but my work with others in my robotic center who are in drone research, one of the concerns about distracting other workers, especially where, where drones are still kind of quite a novelty, everyone, if they hear a drone, they get distracted, their eyes go to the sky, and they're searching around for a drone. So I could see that potentially as uh, a consequence. 
initially as drones are, are being introduced across workplaces, being a distractor, and, and there's the privacy issue too. I think a lot of people feel their privacy is invaded when they see a drone flying overhead. Um, I know those aren't maybe direct um, factors for workplace exposure, um, but certainly affect the psych psychosocial response. Uh, this is Fadi. I'm kind of following up on uh, Don's comment. Um, actually, the one of the pictures that she used in her slide is actually for the spraying uh, operation in agriculture. Actually, came from uh, a colleague in our department, and and they were using actually a miniature um, helicopter to to do the spraying, and they had to go through quite a bit of uh, uh, you know red taping because the FAA was was not allowing them to fly since. It, since it's a commercial uh, situation. So the way around it was you have to be actually a pilot, uh, licensed pilot to operate these, these uh, drones or these, in this case it's a miniature helicopter uh, pilot list. So it was it's very difficult uh, you know, to get those uh, over overhead. Uh, at least these are because bigger than the normal drones. And then I, I kind of second the issue of, of load and then if you have a battery die on the, on the drones, there's a very good chance it's going to fall on someone, especially in an area where a lot of workers are working. Thank you very much, everyone. At this moment, we have no more questions. Uh, at this point, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Sarah Feltner for any concluding comments. Thank you, Pete. And thank you again, uh, Don, uh, Fadi, and Andrew for these excellent uh, presentations. This was a great way to kick off our 2019 series on emerging issues. Um, and we also want to thank all of you for joining us. We will uh, include you in future communication about our webinars. Our next one is coming up in June. Um, and our, uh, on June 12th, thank you, Donjania, um, on occupational safety and health issues of emerging technologies. And we'll close out the 2019 series in September on the 18th with a discussion on the future of work and the need for an expanded focus for occupational safety and health. So unless there is a last minute uh, question, um, if any of the presenters have any final comments, Okay, thank you all for joining us and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks very much.